Alright, can you guys open in your Bibles to 2 Chronicles 34? 2 Chronicles 34, if you have your Bibles, take them out, or grab your phones, or grab your tablets, whatever it is that you guys have. Um, I'm going to really, really, really speak. You guys know that I'm a, I'm a passionate guy. Um, it's pretty obvious from almost anything I do in life. Like if, if they're just, even Adam has said that to me. He said, when you're passionate about something, it's like game over. You're all in. And when it, when it comes to God, there's nothing in my life that I'm more passionate about. So I'm going to talk to you out of my, my heart today. Um, and, and I want to say this. Like this, is gonna, this might seem weird and strange to you. It's okay. Um, at any point in time, I believe God wants to move powerfully at the end of the message today. Um, and I believe that he does want to release fire in the house and fire in the room. And um, The Bible says this in 2 Timothy chapter 1. It says, fan in the flame the gift of God that's in you through the laying on of my hands. This is Paul writing to Timothy. He's not talking about a spiritual gift. We often equate that to a spiritual gift. And we know that there were things that, we know that there was gifts upon Timothy's life. We know that Paul laid hands on Timothy and said, you know, don't neglect the, the, the spiritual gift that's in you, or just don't stir up, I forget how he said it, but about the prophetic utterance over your life. But when he's in 2 Timothy 1, writing, fan into flame the gift of God that's in you through the laying on my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. What he's talking about is what Peter was referencing in Acts chapter 2, which is you have now received the gift of the Holy Spirit in your life. The gift of the Holy Spirit in your life is to make Jesus famous in all the earth. It's, it's to cause you to know Jesus and for, for him to make Jesus known through you. John 14, 15, and 16 is the job description of the Holy Spirit. And there are certain things that are upon your life. See, when you talk about things like the baptism of the Spirit, and people kind of get a little sketchy and a little weird because they're saying, they sometimes hear, are you saying that I don't have the Spirit of God? No, because Ephesians 1 says that you were sealed in him after you heard the word of truth. So it's the Spirit of God that causes you to be born again, Nothing is born in the kingdom without the Spirit's activity. I want to make that known, a point clear real quick because we're going to go after some things today, some dead things in our lives. I just, I just really believe that uh, what I hear the Lord saying over this house is, is we have done a pretty good job, and I don't mind saying it, patting myself on the back here, we have done a pretty good job, I believe, of being obedient to where He's leading and taking us. And I, I believe that, 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 that we spend some time, you've heard me talk about things like maturity, and, and I'm going to use some natural illustrations. It might make some of you feel a little weird. That's okay. But there's a maturing that's taking place in you for you to receive what heaven wants to do through you. And I'll, I'll make that real clear as we go forward here. But there are certain things in your life that are happening because you've been immersed. That word baptized means to be immersed. When you're baptized in water, there's evidence. You come up wet. When you're baptized into Christ, when you're baptized into the Lord, there's evidence. There's a new life. There's new desires. There's new interests. When you're baptized in the Spirit, there tends to be evidence. And some of that evidence is passion and boldness. And you can now do things that you couldn't do before. You have the ability for the gifts of God to move and flow through your life. There are things that happen because you're immersed in the Holy Spirit. But I do not believe that you're called to just live off of one time. Just one feeling. Here's what I believe God is bringing us to. And I've been preaching this stuff for years, but God keeps taking the message in me, in my life, that he's given to me. Because the word of the Lord has to come to you, and the message has to come to you for the messenger to go and speak what it is that the Lord is saying. But I believe, guys, every significant move of God in my life has been the byproduct of desperation in my heart. And God moves through his discontented ones. He, can't, he, he moves, when, when, you, when you get dissatisfied, when my, one of my greatest concerns is sometimes I think we get to a place where we've experienced, I, or if I could just say it this way, some, my greatest concern is that we just get stagnant in our walk, that we just don't desire as much as we used to. The more you desire, the more you accelerate, the more that you grow, but if you don't desire God, I don't know what, how to help you. And that desire comes from Him. Every single one of you, if, if all things were made by him, for him, and through him, within every human being, is a God-responding mechanism. You were created to walk with him, to know him, and to make him known. And I believe that his voice is going forth. I keep talking about that God's raising up a voice, but his voice is going out. His voice is going forth into all the, even the lost, they're, they're, they're starting to recognize this voice that's calling out of their heart, that's speaking to them because you respond to what it, he, he puts it in you and you have to respond to it. It's our responsibility. But I keep hearing this phrase. I was ministering at a retreat 
last weekend, and before I stood up to preach, I heard the Lord say, desperate times call for desperate measures. And I believe we're in a desperate time that's calling forth desperate measures. And I want you to know, I know I turned you to 2 Chronicles 34, I may not get there, so I'm just going to go with what God's doing. Listen, there's nothing, listen, there is nothing more desperate in the world, naturally speaking, nothing more desperate than a woman that wants to have a child but can't. There is nothing more desperate. Now, my story is not your story. My wife and I went through this with our first child. We were labeled infertile. We went through the infertility process after about a year of trying to get pregnant with Emma. Some of you have been going after it a lot longer than me. Some of you shorter than me. But there's nothing more desperate on the earth than a woman that wants to have a child but can't because she's barren. And here's the thing. We'll go through to any length medically to make it happen. Listen to me. We will, we will we'll go through tests. Is it the man's issue? Is it the woman's issue? Is, is there something wrong with the ovaries? Is there something wrong with, you know, who knows what? Is there, um, oh God, help me. All right. We'll, we'll do things like this. We'll go get tests done. We'll get put on medication like Clomid. We'll, 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 we'll explore things like in vitro and, and artificial insemination. There's no lengths that we won't go to to ensure having a child. Now watch this. Sometimes it's the man's issue, right? Sometimes, sometimes the, the man's sperm count. Forgive me, I know it's going to sound like health class too bad because there's just things in there that, that are true even spiritually speaking. Sometimes, sometimes it's the man's issue, but I want you to hear me real quick. This is going to sound crude, crass. Forgive me, it's going to be on tape. God's not shooting blanks. There's something wrong with our womb. When you look at Matthew 13 and you read things like the parable of the of, of the um, the parable of the sower, it's not the problem isn't with the seed. The problem's with the soil. And there's things that there the, the man goes out and he starts scattering seed, and it's the word of God. And there are some people that hear and they don't understand, and the birds of the air come and they snatch it up, and then there's some that fall among these places that are that, are, that don't have much depth of soil and the root goes down and the thing springs up instantly, but because it has no depth of root, the, the, the persecution comes and chokes it out. Then there's things like the anxieties and the life and the worries and riches. How many of you know there are some women that don't get pregnant because of the stress in their life? Desperate times, guys, are calling for desperate measures. There's nothing more desperate on the earth than a woman that wants to have child but can't. And this is what the Lord keeps thumping my heart about. There should be nothing more desperate than a church that can't give birth to the things of God. There should be, I'm, okay, now I'm feeling it. All right. There should be nothing more desperate than a Christian. That can't give birth to conviction, that can't birth disciples, that can't give birth to a kingdom that's supposed to be inside of you. But we've learned to be content with what's upon us, and I believe that God's changing that. There should be nothing more desperate than a church that can't represent Christ to a dying world. There should be nothing more desperate. And you know what? There's nothing that's going to be born in your life but by the Spirit's activity. He's the one that called you to be, he's the one that causes you to be born again. He's the one that causes your life to burn like fire. And it will not happen unless you yield to him. Unless you say, here I am, take me. You read the story of Rachel in Genesis chapter 30. And I've talked about this a couple weeks ago where... Where, where Jacob is, is wedded to Leah, it's not the one he wanted, it wasn't the one who was promised to him. And then in Genesis chapter 30, verse 1, we read, now that, now, that, now that Rachel's with Jacob and Leah's bearing all these children, this is what Rachel says, give me children or else I'll die. That's a pretty desperate place. 
And then, then Jacob says, well, I'm not in the role of God. I can't do that. Give me children or else I'll die. How, what does is, what is desperation look like in your life? Are you content with where you are? Listen to me. He said it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The keys are in your hands. What are we doing? Come on. You cannot be satisfied by information. It's by the fire of God in your life. Moses was drawn to a burning bush. What if God sets your life on fire? What if God releases his fire upon a church like that? When I say church, I'm not talking about praise. I'm talking about universally across the world. God comes for desperate men. You know what desperation is? There, listen to me. For a woman to get pregnant, the conditions have to be exactly right. Within the woman's menstrual cycle, there's a maturing that takes place. Remember how I talked about maturing? There's a maturing that takes place with the egg. And sometimes it's more than one egg that's released. Down the fallopian tube, into the uterus, that she might receive the fertilization of her husband. Your desperation is your ovulation. that brings the egg within you to maturity that you might receive the fertilization of heaven. But if you're not desperate, that heaven will never meet you in that place. Give me children or I'll die. Every great man and woman of God that I've ever read has been brought to a place of loneliness by the Lord and men in a place of wilderness in the face of desperation. Men like Charles Finney who wrestled with God until, you know what God's wanting us to do? He wants us to be like a Jacob. Do you know what God's doing? God is causing the earth to be aware of, of the fact that God is here and I did not know it. He's awakening you and I to the reality that he's here. There is a difference between a Jacob and an Esau. Esau got very content. Jacob never was. And because of that, a dream came upon him, and he saw the ladder reaching up to heaven, and angels were ascending and descending, and then he woke up and concluded, the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. We ask God all the time, would you come, would you come, would you come? He's here. This is what David said, where can I go, whether it's the highest heaven or the, down in the shoal, your presence is there, I can't escape you. Here's what God's going to begin to do. I feel this in my heart. He's going to begin to reveal himself like never before. You know why? Because the church that worships him, he's drawn to the worshiping church. He's drawn to the worshiping heart. He's drawn to the hungry and the desperate that say it should not be like this. It cannot be this way. There is so much available to you and I in the Lord and we're so content with where we are. And it should not be that way. Not while there's people out there waiting. Not, if, if, gosh, man, like, if we really were convinced of what we had, that the world was looking for that, it'd be different. And education's not getting it done, church. The world would look different if we're the most educated people on the planet. And all the stuff that's coming to you is distracting you from you getting alone and saying, come and burn me. Come bring your coal off the altar and touch my lips. Give me children or I'll die. Desperate times call for desperate measures. And there's nothing more desperate than you praying. Nothing can take. There is no substitute for prayer. None. Where you hit your knees and you lift your hands and you say, God, it can't keep going on like this. Rachel, listen to me. This is going to sound like a pretty strong ad, like just charge and I don't mean it to be. Rachel in that time... Barren women, Israel speaking, Old Testament times, were a reproach to the people around them. It was not cool to be barren. God has cursed you. There's something wrong with you. You can't bear children. Listen to me. The church is a reproach to the world if we're barren.
We are a reproach to the world if we, you know what? It is not okay for him to be on our lips and for our hearts to be far from him. Your life, guys, your life, hear me, your life is the womb of heaven. And God is scattering seed. And there's nothing wrong with his seed. It's our ability to contain it. And for it to grow inside of us. And unless you're desperate, you won't produce 30, 60, or 100 fold. You know why? Because you'll get content and maybe somebody will, you won't be convinced of what you've heard. Somebody comes along and questions it and now you're not even sure of what you believe. Or all of a sudden life happens and the anxiety and all this stuff, the, the world's riches and things that people worry about come upon you. And now you, you, you're double minded in your, all your ways. Let me read to you some of these women in the Bible who were barren. And I want you to hear who they gave birth to. Because listen to me. These women in the Old Testament are new, are, is the New Testament church representation of what's possible through your life if you allow yourself to become like these. But listen to me. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not, you know me. I'm not angry at you. I'm pretty pumped up. And I'm, I'm going after you, you're not going to stop me. Your disagreement with me, you're, you're, you're like, well, this guy's got his chill. You are not stopping me. I will run you over. Because as long as that world is out there, and as long as I don't feel like I'm ministering to it and reaching it in the capacity I like, I will not stop. And there are times and there are seasons in life and in the church and in, with the Lord and in the kingdom that seem to come, and there are certain things that we get to participate in. There are certain things that we're walking in because people have prayed. But then there are certain things that you can't stop, and they're just God's predetermined plan at the fullness of the time moments, and God's sovereignty, and Jesus coming on the earth, you weren't going to stop it. Him coming again, you're not going to stop it. But I believe the church is entering into a time, listen to me, I know it sounds weird, it's okay, where the egg is maturing inside of you for you to finally, for you to finally be fertilized with what it is that heaven wants to bring through your life. But it does not happen except by the Holy Spirit. Because here's the deal, come on, how, how is it guys, this is where I am, how is it that you read, you read this stuff in the Bible and they pray and instant results? Instant. Come on, aren't you tired of praying for people and not seeing them healed? Well, you getting alone and going after a greater grace on your life for that's going to cost you something. Aren't you tired of not being able to hear God's voice in a greater way? Aren't you tired of not having boldness around the workplace? I heard Todd White say one time, it was so convicting and so good, that if you're the only person at work that knows you're a Christian, something's wrong. <clears throat> but that's true. And I'm not saying go and, and preach hell to people. When you threaten enemies, but you warn friends. Because God is reconciling the world to himself. This is what it says of Elijah in James chapter 5. It says he was a man with a nature like ours. That means he was flesh and blood. He was no different than you and me. He was a man with a nature like ours. And when he prayed, it didn't rain for three and a half years. And he prayed again. Not he prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and begged and begged and begged and begged. He prayed again and the heavens opened up and the rain fell. 
And it says, an effective prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. You tell me, why are we seeing more when we pray? Come on, we got all the right language. We're taught how to do this stuff. And if, if, there's, if there's no anointing behind it, if there's no follow-through, if we're not getting results, then I wonder if we really know his heart. What if these guys were more desperate than you and I? What is it going to take for people to come and start persecuting us for to say, Jesus, help? You know what happened in Israel's day? Every time it was calm and it was cool, they started worshiping idols and yada, yada, yada. And then God had to bring judgment on them to wake them up. And then they'd cry out, and they're like, oh God, and then he'd be merciful, and then they'd do it again, and then it was over and over and over again. And you may not be worshiping the ashram and the bales and stuff like that, but there's things that are taking, come on, I don't mind saying it. If there are things taking press in your life, if you think of something else more than Jesus, you're worshiping something else. It says, set your mind on things above. Not on the things of the earth. Not your grocery list. Not worrying about how you're going to make ends meet. Dear God, seek Him and He'll take care of all that stuff. We can't afford to be like Israel. It was written in there so we wouldn't make their mistakes. How many of you are tired of just being bound by the same sin over and over and over again? These guys prayed. They prayed and they instant results. Come on, you've been, you've been lame for 40 years. Let me get you up, buddy. Boom. Silver and gold we don't have. We've got everything else. But we, for us to go up to somebody and say, silver and gold I don't have. What I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazarene. Get up and walk. Come on, that's awesome. It'll never happen unless you go after it. You better, you got to get more desperate than you are right now. I'm only preaching to you how I preach to myself. We need the fire of God so bad. Those boys are filled with the Spirit in Acts chapter 2. They get persecuted. They pray again. Acts chapter 4, boldness comes, a room shakes. Instant results. Bang. Instant. They were obedient people. They, 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 they tarried in prayer till God came forth. See, we lost, we, we've lost the ability to tarry. We're afraid to travail. We think, we think travailing's not intercession anymore. We think that it's not okay to weep before God. Well, no, he was the man of sorrows, and he was moved with compassion, and he had tears. And there is a voice that's heard right now in Ramah, Rachel weeping for her children because they are no more. And Rachel is a type and picture of the church and creation groaning for her children to come forth. You listen to these women in the Bible. There's Manoah's wife in Judges chapter 13 who gives birth to Samson. Man, he was endowed with strength. You have Sarah who gives birth to an Isaac, a Rebecca who gives birth to Esau and Jacob, a Rachel who gives birth to Joseph, an Elizabeth who gives birth to John the Baptist, and a Hannah who gives birth to Samuel. Barrenness. What's barrenness look like for the Christian? Well, I say a whole lot, but my fruit, my, I've got no fruit on my tree. Barren. If your fruit is rotten, barren. If you're, if you're, if you're not living what you're saying, barren. And it's time to turn your heart back to God and seek Him. See, some of you have your heads down because you don't like what I'm saying because you know what I'm saying is true. You don't have to deal with the conviction. My job is just to give the message. I can't force faith response in you. But I will walk out of here knowing that I did my job and I'm cool with where I'm at and I know what I'm going after. And if it causes you to feel bad about yourself, don't feel bad about yourself. Start responding to the conviction in your heart. But if you're going after things in the world more than you are with the Lord, you're going to miss an incredible adventure. You're missing opportunity all the day long.
Here's the reasons why women can't get pregnant. There's sometimes there's an ovulation disorder, fallopian tubes blocked or damaged. There's early menopause. But I wonder, I wonder if, if, if there is such thing as ovulation disorders, which we know that there are. And here's what ovulation is. It's when the egg is released from the ovary and it's the fertile time of your menstrual cycle, ladies. Each month an egg matures inside your ovary. Once it reaches a certain size, the egg is released from the ovary and is swept into the fallopian tube toward the uterus and is ready to be fertilized. I say it all the time, guys. John the Baptist and Samuel, they weren't just merely conceived because of intercourse. You know what happened? Their parents prayed. Their parents were desperate. Hannah travailed. Hannah cried out. Hannah didn't take no for an answer. And I like what Grace said to me the other day. She knows I teach on this so much. She said, you know what Hannah didn't do with her desire? She never went to another man outside of her husband, blamed her husband, said maybe it's his issue. She kept coming to the Lord because she knew the one that closed her womb had the ability to open her womb. And God came upon her and opened it up. We'll probably look at her story here in a minute. Here's, here's something. God commanded, I'm watching my time. God commanded Adam and Eve in the garden to be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth, subdue it. God took from Adam's rib, called it, caused a deep sleep to come upon Adam, reached inside of Adam, reached inside of him, and the one who was made in the image of God, the one who was in the fullness of love, the one who looked like his father, God caused a deep sleep to come upon him, and out of the fullness of God inside of him, reached in and pulled the woman out of him, so that the two can become one, like Adam was saying. Here's something, Ephesians 5 calls, calls it a great mystery that Christ and his church would become one. Because Paul is talking about the husband and wife, but the husband and wife is a type and picture of what, that we are to be fruitful and multiply, but you're to be fruitful and multiply with Jesus. And it's no different, when, even when Jesus was, where was Jesus pierced with the, the, the spear? Right here. Where did, where did Adam, where did Eve come out of Adam? Right here. You're not born unless you're born by the spirit and water. Blood and water came out of the side of Jesus. About a week or two later, the church is birthed through Pentecost. You and I are to be fruitful and multiply with the Lord. If that's not happening, probably ought to figure some things out. I'm going to read it to you just because I've, it's probably one of my favorite stories, but I know I turned, turned you to 2 Chronicles 34. Well, let me, let, me just get, let me just give you the snapshot of 2 Chronicles 34. Just, yeah, turn there. You're there. All right, so let's just read it. It says this, that Josiah was eight years old. And when I read that again yesterday, see, God in 2011, I don't teach on this very often. God in 2011 gave me, I feel, the blueprint of the five things that the church is going to walk through, almost like five phases until we see this great awakening come upon us and the great harvest come, come like never before. And the good news is we're still in phase one. That's actually a joke. I wish we were in stage five. But here's, here's the point. God gave it to me through this man's life. Josiah was eight years old, and I would say this to you, that God is getting ready to move among our young ones. Eight years old. When he became king and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. That's a good, it's a good thing. He did right. Now check this out. He did right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David and did not turn aside to the right or the left. This is a generation that God is raising up right now. For in the eighth year of his reign, which would have made him what? 16. Watch this. What did he begin to do? While he was still a youth, he began to seek the God of his father David. And in the twelfth year, which would have made him 20, in the twelfth year he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the ashram, the carved images, and the molten images. Why? Because as he sought 
the God of his father David, in two years, God birthed something in him and gave him a vision for reform. That never would have happened unless he was seeking God and God would have put that inside of him. And I want you to hear that this is a desperate time in the life of Israel. This is a very, very dark time. And let me tell you what's going on. They know the language. They are still doing all the rituals. They are still going through the motions. You know one of the scariest places in the Bible is? It's the white page between the Old and New Testament. 400 years of silence. 400 years of not a voice. 400 years of still going through the motions and never hearing a word from the Lord. Because people are content with the motions. They tore down the altars of the Baals in his presence and the incense altars that were high above them he chopped down. Also the ashram, the carved images and the molten images he broke in pieces and ground to powder and scattered it on the graves of those who sacrificed to them. He's an intense guy. Then he burned the bones of the priests on their altars and purged Judah and Jerusalem. In the cities of Manasseh, Ephraim, Simeon, even as far as Naphtali and the surrounding ruins, he also tore down the altars and beat the ashram and the carved images into powder and chopped down all the incense altars throughout the land of Israel. Then he returned to Jerusalem. This guy is kicking butt. And he's not putting up with it. And he's basically saying, this house belongs to the Lord. Eve, do you know that your life, your heart, when Jesus goes in and he turns tables over, and it says, zeal for your house will consume me. Where does Jesus live? Where? In you. That is a type and picture of what he does when he comes in your heart. Get this crap out of here. And he kicks out what doesn't belong there. Things that we erect, things that we put there in place of him, places that we draw value from and find security in. And all that stuff is coming down. All the man-made ways. Because he's bringing us back to himself. Now watch this. Now in the 18th year of his reign, he'd be 36. <laughs> when he had purged the land in the house, he sent Shaphan, the, the son of Azaliah, and Messiah, an off official of the city, and Joah, the son of Johaz, the recorder to repair the house of his God. Now I want you to hear this. Here's what happens. All the motions going through the stuff. They've got things in there that don't belong there. Stuff that they're worshiping that they should. You worship whatever you love. You worship wherever you draw significance from. If you, now watch. If you draw significance from your spouse, you put your spouse above God. If you worship your children... And draw significance from your children. What they can do for you, they sit in the throne of God. There's a reason why Abraham was asked to sacrifice his son. Because man, what man was created to enjoy has the potential of sitting on a place in man's heart that it shouldn't be sitting in. Now God was never going to have Abraham uh, sacrifice. He knew what was in Abraham's heart, but he, Abraham needed to know for himself. Lest you hate your mother and father, you can't be my disciple. Man, that's a powerful statement. Man, do you know that there's... So, you can't go wrong with preaching the red letters, but so many refuse to preach them. He says some hard things in there. Here's one. Oh, here's one. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. Well, that doesn't make me feel good. That's your Savior. What's he saying? There is no compromise. It's this or that. He said, if you're not for me, you're against me. I don't want to be fighting against him. Here's what happens. Let me just wrap this up, and I'm going to read some out of 1 Samuel. Here's, here's what happens. They're going through the temple and they uncover the book of the law. 
Now, people don't like to talk about the law because they think, well, it's, you know, it's, it's the list of do's and don'ts. It was God's heart written down on stone for his people. He knew if you walked in this way, what was the covenant? If you walk in this way, I will be your God and you will be my people. And it will be well with you. That's an amazing promise. You know what they said? Ah, we don't want that. We'll go after the counsel of our own ways. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, lean not on your own understanding. Right? Here's, here's what happens. They uncover, you should read this chapter, it's amazing. They find the book of the law. This guy, Hilkiah, comes and they report to Josiah. Look what we found. It begins to be read to Josiah, and Josiah rips his garments and begins to repent before God. You know what? It wasn't for, it, what, he didn't put it there. And he didn't say, my, my, geez, these generations before me, what a bunch of idiots. He began to, with the people, identify with them and cry, and God had mercy upon them. It wasn't a list of do's and don'ts. It was the word of God. And he rips his garments. Here's what God spoke to me one day. Very similarly, the church is going to go through a time where we see how far away we have gotten from Him. And there will be a time, mark my words, you will see it, there will be a time of great repentance that sweeps this land. Where we do what? God have mercy on us. And put your fire back inside of us. Because his fire comes upon everything sacrificed to him. Your life is a living and holy sacrifice. Do not be conformed to the world. If you're conformed to the world, there's something wrong. And you need to change your mind. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Watch. That you might prove the good and acceptable will of God. If I cannot prove the will of God in my life... I still got to get alone with him till it becomes a reality through me. I don't care, church, I don't care how great your program is. Oh God, I'm going to get in trouble. I don't care how great leadership is. I don't care how great it's developed. Only thing I care about is who's hungry for God. God takes the hungry heart, the desperate heart, and he causes it to burn. It doesn't matter how developed the program is, how polished the music is. If God is in the place, people will come. That's what draws them here. Come on. There was the grace, the manifestation of grace and truth. Jesus Christ. And everybody followed him. Prostitutes wanted to touch his garment. People don't want to touch us anymore. They don't want what we have. Because they think we're selling something on them. John Wesley prayed, it set me on fire. Let the world watch me burn. We're constantly trying to make better and refine. And No, seek him till you look like him. Till you find him. Till you touch people and they're miraculously healed. We can't afford to go up and down where we're chasing after healing and now we're not. And we're chasing after prophecy and now we're not. And we're chasing after identity and now we're not. No, there's so much available to us. People like Martin Luther used to say the more he had to do, the more he prayed that day. That doesn't even make sense to the rational mind. The more he had to do, the more he prayed for five hours a day. One of the number one questions people will often ask is, Brother, I, I don't have time in my day. How do I do this? I've got kids. I'm telling you, you can find it. You're not looking hard enough. There was nobody more in demand than Jesus. And he found time. Sometimes he was up all night. Now I'm not there and I'm not pretending to be, but I think that's pretty awesome. I have a hard enough time getting up for my wife and just taking the kids from her. I'd rather stay in bed and sleep. You know what happened to Jacob? Jacob awoke. God was here, I didn't even know. 
God is causing men and women to wake up from their slumber. It's a pretty desperate time for Josiah. They're about as far away and as crooked as you can get. I'm going to read this last thing and then we'll just go ahead and... Man, I'm just going to ask you to respond today. Well, that's, some pretty, that's pretty cool. Cool picture, Brandon. Turn to 1 Samuel 1. I know you've heard me teach out of this so many times, but I want you to look at it again. 1 Samuel 1. What I wanted to do and didn't was if God was speaking to you and hitting you, I was actually going to ask people to come up and just, just sit Indian style up here up front. Because I, I believe that God's going to meet you in this place. Some, I'm telling you, like if God, if God is moving, some of you like, I, I be, well, we'll just get there. But I believe there's going to be a response. Say, listen, I don't know what God wants to do. I'm in the same boat, guys. I'm not laying hands on people because I've arrived. Like what I'm saying is there's got to, we just need to take prayer more seriously. All it takes is one to open the dam, so thanks, Heather. Now there was a certain man from Ramathim Zophim from the hill country of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, an Ephraimite. Sometimes it's just hard to get through that stuff. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah and the name of the other Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. I'm starting to understand this more. I'm starting to understand more that it's not okay. It's not okay. It's not okay as a child of God to not have fruit. It's not okay to not take this stuff seriously. That's just the Holy Spirit. I, forgive me. When he comes upon me, I stomp because I get excited. I used to bend over like this a lot, but I don't do that so much anymore. Now this man would go up from his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas were priests to the Lord there. When the day came that Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had closed her womb. This is what Hannah said. I don't care what the world can do for me. I need God to move on my behalf. That's what she's saying. I don't care what you offer me. I don't care how much you tell me I look like this. I don't care how much Elkanah, my husband, the one whom I love, I don't care how much you dote on me. I don't care how much you flatter me. All I know is that I want children and I can't have them. And all I know is I want to look like Jesus. And he's got to do it in your life. And if you don't want that, that's your privilege. Go home, you can hang out and watch The Bachelor. I don't care. Whatever. Well, I'm going after it. It happened year after year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she would provoke her. So she wept and would not eat. Now that's some desperation. Fasting and weeping before God. I, I think we're getting to the place, guys, where, where we, we see what's available. The Bible, the Bible, guys, you have to understand something. Like, the Bible is the word of God is profitable for correction and repute and the training in righteousness. The Bible, yes, will show you what's right with you, but it will also show you what's off and needs adjusted. That needs aligned. 
And when I look at these men and women in the Bible, I'm not, I'm not stupid. Like, I, I, I look at them, and I'm like, wow, like, God moved through them. And I, I want to be used like that. I want to be, people say, well, you're, you know, you, you're so heavenly minded, you have no earthly good. That is a lie. That's baloney. You can be too earthly minded for too heavenly good. I want to be so heavenly. I want to walk with an awareness of the people that are around me. You want to walk into a place and your receptivity to the Lord is so trained that you know what he's doing in a moment. And you see who it is. You, you, you pick up on the fact that somebody's in the room and they feel like it's better that if they were to die than to live. I, I don't want to do it anymore. The whole reason why I pray is because he has the ability to make me like him. And he will not do it unless I yield to his will of wanting to. The game of church is coming to an end. The flashy program is failing. Desperation is rising up in this people of God. That lift their eyes to heaven and know where their help comes from. And says, would you come down? It's not enough for you to stay up there. Come here. Come here in our midst. He's the one that causes you to be born again. He's the one that causes rivers of living water to flow out of you. He's the one who activates the, the gifts in your life. He's the one that puts fire upon you. And I believe God's bringing us to a place where we begin to weep again. Guys, it's not, it's not okay! Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep and why do you not? Amen. The people in your life may not understand. Your husband may not understand. Doesn't mean don't love your husband and submit to him. He may not understand your desperation, how hungry you are. But I'll never let my desperation cause me to step out of line and not serve Adam. I'll never let my desperation take me out of line and not be a father. Not be a husband. Come on, some of us need to be desperate in those places. Then Hannah rose after eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She, greatly distressed, prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Sometimes the church won't understand you. Who's Eli? The priest. Well, he's about as backslidden as they get, him and his sons. She made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, come on, watch this. If you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me, and not, not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son. Then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And a razor shall never come on his head. Now it came about as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli was watching her mouth. You know that there's a groaning inside of you? Too deep for words. But the Spirit knows what you're praying inside. Do you know the first fruit of the Spirit in your life is that you get on board with what He's groaning for? Wanting to do in your life? For Hannah, she was speaking in her heart, but only her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. So Eli thought she was drunk. Then Eli said to her, How long will you make yourself drunk? Put away your wine from you. But Hannah replied, No, my Lord, I am a woman oppressed in spirit. I've drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I've poured out my soul, my soul before the Lord, my thoughts, my hopes, my dreams, my intentions. I poured them out before God because I know he's the only one that can do something.
I'm going to make a statement. It's going to be strong. Some of you are in such places of influence, and you're doing nothing with the influence you have. And the concern of what people think has to, has to go. The other day, I was dropping my van off at Toyota of York, and I'm standing there, and I, mean, I look right at the guy that's about to wait on me, and the Lord says to me, this guy is an incredible father, and he's giving his children what he never had growing up. And he's a hard-looking dude. I don't even know if he's got kids. I don't even know if he's married. And you make a decision right then and there of how you're going to respond. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, and there's people around. I'm like, God, just let these people walk away. Because you know you're putting something on the line. And I, I, I walk, I mean, I'm standing there and I'm talking to him. I said, hey, man, I said, are you a father? And he just turned around and he showed me his, he's got three girls. Which I'm like, that's cool, man. I've got four. He goes, four. So anyway, he and I were talking. He just was amazed by that. I said, hey, man, I don't know how you're going to take this, but let me tell you something. I said, I... I when I looked at you earlier, I felt like God said to me, you're an amazing father, and you're giving your girls what you never had growing up. It, boom, stopped him. Boom, dead. The guy standing next to him, all, tattoos all over the place. Eyes wide. He just goes, the guy, the guy, the, the, the guy that I told to just kind of stunned and, and reaches out his hand and says, man, I, man, thank you so much. You just changed my entire day. Now the guy standing next to him made his way out from behind the counter and said, sir, sir, and I stopped and he stuck out his hand and he goes, you just made my day so much better by making his day better because I work for him. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> it's that simple if we get beyond this thing. Now, I've, I know what it's like to go in and out of season being zealous in public, and you're praying for every sick person, and you're prophesying over whoever you can. And I used to stand at the Rita's water ice line and say, let me tell you what I feel like God's saying to me about you. And I want that kind of consistency all the time. We're, you know what? It's, just, it's, it's fear, 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 fear. And it's got to go. But I believe that God is bringing his church, every move of God in my life, every move of God has been because I was desperate. Every time. Call it anguish, call it desperation. There is nothing born without anguish and desperation. Nothing born. Come on, moms. Nothing born without travailing. Pushing and pushing and wanting to give up and pushing and all that stuff and just, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I can do it. We need to labor in prayer again. And I believe God's going to take this church. We're becoming a house of praise, but we have to become a house of prayer. Where we take seriously the fact that God's moved by it. Do not consider your maidservant as a worthless woman, for I have spoken until now out of my great concern and provocation. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant your petition that you have asked of him. She said, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad because she felt like she got her answer. Then they arose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord and returned again to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah had relations with his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Had relations, had intercourse, but she became pregnant the moment God heard her cry. At desperation matured something inside of her where at the right time, I love this stuff, Samuel came and was a voice to his generation. Samuel, Samuel came to, to a time when the word of God was rare. Do you know what the world is waiting to hear? The word of God. Through your life, through my life, through my mouth, through how I live. It came about in due time 
after Hannah had conceived that she gave birth to a son, and she named him Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. Gave birth to a prophet. Gives birth to a John the Baptist, a Samson, a Jacob, an Isaac. Promises of God. I'll say this and then, I know I'm way past the time. Let me just say this. Because I, I don't know what God's going to do. I mean, I, I just know we're going to spend some time up here. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And when he prayed, the heavens shut up its rain for three and a half years. And when he prayed again. So you know what he did? He prayed and he prayed again. He prayed and he prayed again. The earth, the heavens released its rain. Do you know when the earth is healed? Do you know when you and I are healed? Do you know when you and I come alive? It's when heaven releases its rain upon us. Elijah said, I see a cloud. It's the size of a man's hand. And I hear the sound of a roar of a heavy shower. And he tells Ahab, the most wicked king of the time, to gird up his loins and start running. Well, actually, Elijah girds up his loins. But it says, he, he outran a chariot. Now, he's a man with a nature like ours. And the spirit of might came upon him, and he outran horses. And we just want to see the rerun of Family Guy. See, you either love me or you hate me. There is no divide with me. Because I'll call out the stuff you're in. And those aren't the ones that hate me. They just need to go get their children. <laughs> AJ, he might. I don't know where he stands with me. <laughs> hey, I'm here to serve you guys right now. We're just going to pray. These altars are open. They're open for you to travail. They're open for you to come and just receive what it is that God wants to do, for God to move mightily in your life. Do you have something, Dana? Okay. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, that's fine. Dane is going to play a song for us and, and Michaela. And hey, listen. It's, if you need to go get your kids, go get them. That's not God to sit here and not get your kids. You honor the workers and you go get them. You can come back in here and all that stuff. And this, is, this, is why, this is why we need to do stuff like Encounter Nights because anyway. We can make allowance for this stuff more in the evening. So I'm going to pray. Dana's going to sing. Listen, it's okay. I don't want anybody to be sitting there in the chairs being like, well, I'm not up there. You know why some of you aren't up here? Because you're already doing this in your life. Or hey, you're just not there yet. That's fine. That's totally okay. But for the ones that are up here, I want you to do this. If you're going to stay here in the auditorium, I want you to just pray for the people that are up here. Because I, I, we, we, want, we want to see God do something so deep in them that's never been done before. I want to see the fire. I, I, I want the fire of God to come upon people, upon our lives. That we fan into flame the gift of God that's inside of us. And Dana's going to lead us in, in, uh, in, and she got a text from Amanda Ilgen for it. She said, I just feel like you're supposed to sing Set a Fire. And I mean, that's obviously a very appropriate song. We know we do it here quite often. But we're going to pray. And then I'm just going to, those of you that are sitting on the floor, I'm just going to come by maybe and just lay hands on you. But this is your response to what it is that God is doing. And if you felt conviction in your heart and you felt like you needed to come up here because you felt the burning of what I was saying, if you're not already up here, you can make your way up here. The greatest moves of God that I've seen at the altar had nothing to do with me touching anybody. It had to do with them before the Lord. Because repentance came in the room. 
And here's all repentance can be. I've been doing life on my own strength. And God, I see that I need you now more than ever. Repentance can be, God, I've neglected the fire that's inside of me. Because I've settled for something less. I've settled for information. I've settled for education. I've settled for, you know, this something other than an actual relationship with you. I'm going to ask that you come, God, and burn in me again. And do, do again in me what you did back then, but even more. So, Father, I just ask right now, in Jesus' name, I thank you, God. I'm under no pressure. Nobody's under any pressure in this room right now. You said that you would baptize your people with Holy Spirit and with fire. And I am thankful, Holy Spirit, that you are here. Your presence is here. There are times when we're more aware of it. But I ask that you would meet us right now in the place of desperation. Or maybe as we preached a couple weeks ago, in the valley of dryness, in the valley of hopelessness, in the valley of despair, in the valley of desperation. God, there's nothing your fire can't do. There's nothing your fire can't do. It burns up what needs burned up, it purifies what needs purified. Your fire, <laughs> your fire. Elijah said, the God who, the one who answers by fire, He's the Lord. He's God. And some of us, we've offered our lives to things and the fire was never released. Because the things that man finds hope in and security in can't answer by fire. But you do. You're the God who answers with fire. And you're the God who dances among his people. And you're the God who comes and touches and strengthens. And Father, I pray that we would begin to cry out in our own way where it is that we need you most. Father, I just ask that you forgive us for being more educated than we are anointed. I ask that you forgive us for becoming prideful on what we think we know rather than what we can actually do. I ask that you would forgive us for neglecting that you would once again with us begin to fan into flame the gift of God that's in that's in each and every one of these people that you would come like a fire and do what only you can do as we see our desperate need for more our desperate need that you're 